presentation. I'm your host, Katie McBride, an advisor for the LHH International Center for Executive Options, or ICEO. ICEO partners with organizations and executives to provide advisory services and coaching through executive career transitions or inflection points. In addition to serving as an ICEO advisor, I have a communications consulting firm and co-launched a career mentoring business, mentoring business and careers for students. And I chair the Mike Hillage School of Business Board of Directors. Prior to these ventures, I spent most of my career at General Motors as a communications in, um, executive. And today I'm thrilled to be joined by Wade Walborn. Wade is an entrepreneur, a board member, a strategic advisor, and a member of the ICEO team. Before creating this impactful portfolio of positions, he had a really successful career in the global energy industry. Wade served in key leadership roles for 30 years, most recently as an executive at Baker Hughes, one of the world's largest oil field services companies. Please join me in welcoming Wade Walborn. Hi, Wade. Hi, Katie. So Wade, let's start with your career story. Um, why don't you walk us through your journey, especially your leadership roles? What do you okay. think you know, contributed to your ability to advance, succeed, and contribute in the energy industry? Okay, well, it was a, it was a learning process along, along the way for sure, and one that I started at the bottom, literally. When I, when I got out of school, I had a petroleum engineering degree, and it was one of those times in the market where no one was hiring. So I actually, my first job out of college with my engineering degree in my pocket was driving a truck. Um, so I worked through that, finally caught on with uh, Baker Hughes and had the great opportunity to go and live all over the world. So I started out with them in, in Texas and a few cities in Texas and um, in, an, in an engineering capacity. Then I moved to Venezuela, um, initially in an in, in engineering capacity as well. Um, from Venezuela, I had the opportunity to move to Argentina where I really got into my first leadership uh, position and it was managing <clears throat> three countries. So I had Argentina, I had Bolivia and I had, uh, we had a small operation in, in Chile, which was interesting. And that's where I really started this transition of engineer focused on providing technical solutions and to broadening my scope and building teams and uh, speaking with executives from my client base, as well as was inside the company. And something unique happened when I was in Argentina. Well, maybe not, maybe not unique for Argentina, but definitely unique for me. The, uh, the country absolutely imploded after I'd been there for one month. And by that, I mean the, the currency was tacked to the dollar was one to one. They went through a devaluation period where they um, had actually seven presidents within a week and the exchange rate ended up being 4.2 to one. So I had no idea what was going on, but lo and behold, we were able to work through that um, renegotiating contracts with all of our customers. And we actually had record profitabilities from, from there. Um, so that kind of propelled me into a larger position still in Latin America where I moved up. I took on um, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and we had a small, we had a small operation in El Salvador. So I initially went to Colombia. Um, it was actually a, another turnaround. It, it was much easier than in Argentina. And within a couple of months, um, I got a call from, uh, from the president of the company to, to head to Nigeria, which I initially declined because I'd actually gone from Colombia and I was in Ecuador. So I'd been in Ecuador for three months. Our moving boxes had just arrived. By this time I had three small children um, and I was, I was just at the point where I wasn't ready to move, but they called back and they threw a little carrot out there and they said, hey, you know, take your wife, spend the weekend in Paris on us, no pressure. <laughs> so so off I went excited uh excited to see Paris and I got to uh Nigeria and I saw what was probably the biggest opportunity to make a change in the entire company so I I took that position um <clears throat> and grew in from a product line specific to managing three product lines while while I was there 
Um, and from that point, they moved me to uh, South Africa, down to Cape Town. And I took on a role of all of Sub-Saharan Africa. So each, each progression is bigger opportunities, bigger roles, bigger chance to make a difference, more learning experiences, bigger and better challenges. Um, and then I got a call to go back to Nigeria. And this time it was a much easier decision because it was for the managing director, vice president position for all of, all of Nigeria. Um, I went back there. I did that for about two and a half years. Uh, got another call actually to move to uh, Tulsa and manage the only product line that had not transitioned to Houston over the years. As many of you probably know, Houston is the oil and gas hub of the world. Most companies have transitioned large portions of their business over the years to Houston. Well, there's this one piece of the Baker Hughes business that had not transitioned and still has not transitioned. And it's just to the east of, of Tulsa. So we came here. Um, I think I was in that role for four years and this is my first global role. So it's reaching out, it's touching, it's touching every continent, um, all the countries that Baker Hughes worked in basically. From there, um, we went through a transition where Halliburton was trying to acquire the company. When that ended, there was a reorganization. I headed to Houston to take over all of South America um, from Mexico all the way down from there. I went to Malaysia for a short period of time for nine months, back to Houston um, to manage what was the largest, the largest operating business in, in the company was slightly over $4 billion, there were 6,000 employees. Um, it was a big, great opportunity at the time. And you know, if you, you asked about my ability to advance, succeed and contribute, I, I think if I reflect on my career, at the time, I was always, I was always willing to take that risk that, you know, many others might not have. Uh, they might be thinking in the back of their mind, well, what if I fail? I never really thought that. And then as I transitioned over time, I had mentors and people that helped me move from that engineer to the leader. Um, transition, make sure you're not just telling people what to do, lead with transparency, be authentic. But I think one of the biggest things that helped me, and I, I actually had, a, actually had a, uh, an executive coach for a while, one of the biggest things that she did for me is she helped me understand to be able to actually hear, hear people, you can call it active listening or whatever, whatever you want to call it, but actually hear and understand. Mm -hmm. Hear and understand and respond you know, with your heart. Don't be thinking of I can't wait for them to finish so I can give them my answer and tell them what to do. That really kind of catapulted me to where I had these large teams that would get headed in, in, in the direction we, we wanted to go. And I was very successful at it. Until January of 2020, um, I had a few personal situations that I needed to take care of here in Tulsa, where I'm speaking to you from. And then the company had transitioned uh, through with different different leadership, and it really wasn't that much fun for me anymore. I've been very successful focusing on employees and customers during my career, and that just wasn't uh, the direction we were going. So I, I made that choice in January of 2020 to walk in to my boss's room and our office, and we reached an agreement that it, it was time for me to go do something else. And I, I like to think it was me that approached her, but they didn't they didn't try and stop me, so I'm sure they were they were thinking the same thing. So I moved, I moved back to Tulsa permanently, um, not knowing what I was going to do. Um, you know, got in touch with LHH, or actually <clears throat> Baker put me in touch with LHH. Um, my advisor was a gentleman by the name of George Head, which I don't know if he's he's on the call or not. Um, and it, it was a very trying time for me, right? Because I've never really had to look for a job. I was always just bouncing from one country to the next, one position to the next, always, always growing. And now here I am um, with, without any direction, right? Felt like I was too young to retire. I have four daughters born in all those different countries that I, I mentioned. So uh, I, I wasn't ready to retire, but I had no idea what I was going to do. And <clears throat> The team at, at LHH was, and without them, I probably wouldn't have been able to transition, 
definitely not as quickly as as I did. The the group and you know the the team that George would pull in to assist was absolutely phenomenal. And they actually, you know, you, I got the feeling that everyone actually cared. They weren't punching a the clock. They weren't checking a box. They were really trying to understand my situation and how they could help me get to that next phase in my life. So I actually, during this time, I told George, I said, hey, George, you know, one of the things I've always enjoyed in all of these different countries I've been in is that I had the opportunity to, to help. Whether it was we sponsor a school for the blind in Nigeria or I'm the executive sponsor for the American Heart Association, whatever it is, there's always something to do that's bigger than, than yourself. And I said, man, I, 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 would like, I would like to be an advisor. So he got me in touch with Christy, uh, spoke with Ruben, and here I am. Part of my portfolio career is, is being a, an advisor for LH8. So I don't know if that answered all your questions. That's kind of how I got to, to where I am. Well, that's a really great overview. And I think, you know, clearly you had a really great ride at Baker Hughes. Um, but you know, listening to the to your story, it sounds like you, you really never had to look for a job there. They kept pursuing you for additional opportunities and it, um, you know, and the roles that you played. So it had to have been. It was a bold move to walk in and say, you know, I, I'm ready to walk away from this corporate vice president position. Um, you know, what were you thinking when when you did that? It had to have been very uncomfortable. Well, that's the same thing my mother asked me. What were you thinking? Wait. <laughs> but it was it was very uncomfortable, but it, it was the right, I knew it was the right thing to do. I was um, emotionally stressed out. I, again, I had some personal things I needed to take care of here in Tulsa, which was weighing on me. And the only way I could do that was to be in Tulsa full time. Prior to that, I'd always maintained a home here but I was leaving on Friday morning. I was coming back on Friday morning. I really, I really couldn't be where I needed to be. So yeah, I, I made that uh, leap, and for about two weeks there, it was, it was extremely nervous, and I, I wasn't quite sure if LHH was going to be a part of my severance package until maybe two weeks afterwards, mm -hmm. um, where I, I, I got the email. And I started engaging with the team. I was kind of standoffish at first. I was like, oh, what are you guys going to do? You know, and, and, and the more and more I got into it, the more beneficial I could see it was going to be for me. Just even if I just had to, you know, knock some things around with George about, hey, here's what I'm thinking. Here's where my head is um, to help get me through that uncertainty. It was a very trying time for sure. <clears throat> so you, you did a great job of walking us through your career. Can you kind of walk us through the, uh, the journey of, you know, where you've ended up? Um, running a business, um, having your consulting as an ICO advisor, you know, how did you navigate that process and what was that like? So uh, at first when I, when I left corporate America, I spent some time thinking, is this, is this all I can do? Does it have to be corporate America? I, I was kind of burnt out on the corporate life. Um, you know, I, I wanted to be able to do, I wanted to be able to do some things that I wanted to do. So I had built up over the years, I built up a, a small oil and gas production company, I'd not really ever been involved in it. So I got more involved in that to build that up. Oh, and this was all, mind you, right before COVID. So my mind went to, we're going to build up this company and then COVID happened. Mm -hmm. So I took a step back from that, um, put together a longer term strategy with you know, a few of the people that were, were working with me in that company um, and have had success doing that. I also, with a lot of help from George, was able to land a few short-term uh, consulting opportunities where I, I'd never done that before. And so being able to talk with someone through the consultancy agreements, you know, what are, what are the desired outcomes? What's the timing? What's the pay? Negotiate all that um, was extremely helpful. So I was able to do that to tie me over until I kind of figured out what it was I was going to do. And I wasn't planning on opening Temperature Pro, as you can see on my shirt, as a franchise. And that was not the direction I thought I would go initially. Um, but things changed with COVID and I started listening to what was being offered and 
uh, going through the different companies that were being sent to me. And, and there's a franchising consultant that LHA set me up with that was fantastic, a uh, gentleman by the name of John Armstrong. And he applied absolutely no pressure. He listened to what I told him I wanted if I did go this route, uh, what my skills, I thought my skills were anyway. Um, and he just kept feeding me businesses um, and going through them with me until I found one and I said, hey, this sounds kind of cool. Maybe, maybe I should try this. So I opened up this company in May of last year, um, put together a plan, a vision, which obviously my corporate background helped with. Mm -hmm. And here we go, off to the races. I mean, I'm, we're not where we need to be yet, but uh, so far so good, knock on wood, I guess. So I've got my energy company, um, I've got the franchise, and I'm an advisor for LHH now. I do, I do some, I own the board of a few pro bonos, uh, I'm really close to the American Heart Association here that has had an impact on my life when I was younger. So I try and stay in, in contact with them. And then there's a uh, economic and development board out in Claremore, which I worked at to the east here, which which I'm in contact from time to time. So that all keeps me pretty busy, along yeah. with all the children. <laughs> busy life, for sure. Well, so um, I, I, you've mentioned uh, LHH and the relationship with George and the relationship with John. Were there some other steps that so you, you went from, you know, this very rich career at Baker Hughes to now a range of things that you're doing? It sounds like you had a lot of conversations along the way. What other steps did you take, um, Wade, that, that kind of led you to this portfolio of, of things that you're doing now? I mean, there's, there's a lot of steps. A, a lot of them I can't even recall. I think one thing very important for me was the assessment that I did through LHH that kind of helped me understand where I was mentally in the process and where my background and mindset might be going forward. Um, obviously, I spoke to a lot of mentors from my previous life, people who had, who had left corporate world and had been successful uh, in other positions, got advice from them. Um, there was really, it was not a, it was not a straight line with an arrow, right? It was up and down all around until I, I finally, something went off and I was like, Hey, this is, this is it without knowing if it was going to work, obviously. Um, but being able to trust my own ability to make it work. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a big shift to go from moving from a $4 billion complex global role to the series of positions that you're in now. Um, so how, you know, what, how does that feeling for you to go from something that was that you, you know, a career that was very, you know, consistent and now you experimenting and you came up with this, this really interesting, more local positions. Yeah. Well, similar to a lot of people on the call, I don't think any of us just woke up one day and were executives. So there, there was a process where you go through and you know you are a doer, most likely, at some point in your career. But um, you know, I, I had grown accustomed to having people pretty much take care of any detail that that I needed done, up to even arranging my travel, right? So so that was that was a shock. The uh, the one consistent is people, customers. Wherever you go in the world, the majority of people want the same thing. They want to improve the life of their family. They want to live in peace and they want to be comfortable. So if you can remember those three things and still be authentic with your people, you can do great things. Now, for me, the big learning was uh, all of the details to just start up and run a business that had been taken care, care of, that had been taken care of for me in the past. For instance, I, f I found that Google is extremely powerful. I had no idea <laughs> how powerful Google is, but just, you know, your options are you do it, you hire someone to do it, or you find the appropriate software that helps take care of that for you. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I chose a franchise. I'd never done any of that in the past. And I felt very comfortable with that team to make sure that they would be able to help me help me manage through all of those, all those steps. 
Well, I, you know, one of the things when we had talked earlier, Wade, you said that uh, you really loved developing and mentoring people and providing meaningful work for them at Baker Hughes. Um, and now uh, you're able to do that more locally with the Temperature Pro and uh, with your consulting business, uh, which has to be gratifying. Yeah, and you know, another thing that's really gratifying for me is, is many of my former you know, lower level employees or people that have worked for me in the past, I meet with them on a regular basis. Some of them, I'm lucky enough to be able to have face-to-face -face conversations. Some of them, it's a phone call. A few do via Zoom. Just, you know, just they just like to kick ideas around and and you know get my thoughts. And I'm not bashful, so I will, I will let them know <laughs> my thoughts. But it's 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 actually one of the more pleasing aspects of being able to grow into an executive role is when you can go through, especially you know all these countries I've been in. I think with the exception of one, when I left, I placed a local uh, in that position. Oh, it's extremely gosh. gratifying. And those, you know, those individuals never forget that. Yeah, for sure. Leave a mark all over the world. Well, let's uh, switch a little bit to the personal side. I understand that you had some big personal changes during this process too, not just professionally, including a new marriage and a blended family. So can you share a little bit more about that? Yes, so I got, remarried in uh in february of 2021 and many people on the call are probably old enough to remember the brady bunch well i am living the brady <laughs> between between the two of us there are six six children um five girls and one poor teenage boy well i say that he's he's sometimes it's good for him sometimes not but they range in ages of 21 all the way down to now 14. So that's another thing we have on our plate. And, and I'm taking this call from home. So if you hear some commotion, I, uh, I apologize. That's just the way it is. So this Brady Bunch of Zoom is something that you kind of are used to, it sounds like. That's right, that's right. <laughs> they said, we don't have Alice. Yeah, darn, <laughs> everyone needs an Alice. <laughs> Well, so shifting back to the experience and the journey that you've been on, Wade, as you reflect back on either your corporate career or your transition, or maybe both, what advice would you give yourself? Is there anything you would have done differently? Um, and if so, what and why? You know, for the, I, I try to, I've never been able to look back and say, yeah, I should have done that differently because I look at everything as an opportunity to grow, to learn, to not do again, you know, to make sure I do again, whatever it might be, except in this case. And this is just, I'm talking about just quality of life from a 24 seven corporate executive to where I am now. I should have left earlier. Hmm. Um, and I know there's, you know, there's several, it's hard. It's hard to do that because you're comfortable financially, you've got this big position, you're traveling all over the world. It's hard to do that. But um, me anyway, this is just my own, my own experience. I would have loved to have been able to gone back and left earlier. And that just, it's, it's a freedom thing for me. I can do more of what I wanna do. Um, my perfect, great example of is a few weeks ago, the PGA championship was here in Tulsa, mm -hmm. right? Um, and at the last moment, I just decided, hey, I'm actually when they announced Tiger Woods was going to be here. I bought four tickets and I went one day with three of my kids. I would have never been able to do that at the spur of the moment in my prior life. There was always some, something to do, a deadline to hit, a person who was waiting on you, a board meeting, a presentation, a customer, always something. So. You know, that was kind of uh, the, one of the aha moments for me was was that day where I'm out there with three of my daughters. We're watching Tiger Woods hit the ball right in front of us. And I'm like, I would have not been able to do this, you know, two years ago. So that's the only thing I would have done differently. Yeah. yeah, spontaneity and corporate executive don't necessarily go together. So that's, that's, a, that's a great story. And I do want to say to those of you who are listening in, um, we're getting a few questions, which is wonderful. Um, we are going to open it up for, for questions in a, in a minute here. So if you do have any questions for Wade, just type them in the, the Q&A box and, and we'll get to those soon. Um, so Wade, you know, for many of us, um, the view of 
retirement was based on what our parents' generation expected. And I know with many of the my, my colleagues and people that I speak with, they think that retirement is either, it is really just that or their decisions are binary. Stay with what I'm doing, you know, a corporate role or, you know, go play golf all the time or, you know, whatever the, that a true, you know, wonderful, rich retirement can be. But you're a good example of, of really reimagining that. Like maybe there's something in between. So, um, you know, what, it, how does this, where you are today compare with where you thought you would be? I mean, I, I thought I, I would be in corporate America until I decided I was too old or they decided I was too old and then I would go home and learn how to play golf because I really, I'm not a very good golfer. Uh, that, that's what I thought I would do. Uh, and, you know, as I, as I got to the point where it was weighing on me and I needed to get back here to take care of some personal issues, I realized that I was most likely going to have to do something different. Um, 25 years working in oil field services, you know, there's, there's limited companies that actually would want you or need you after, you after you've gone through that process. And definitely none of them are based in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, so, it, it, I mean, it was a tough decision, but I ended up putting through, uh, you know, I live by my five Fs, which are faith, family, friends, fitness, and finance. And I, I really leaned on the faith part. Um, by the way, Christy Golden has encouraged me to have a sixth F, which is fun. So I'm still working on that, but I'm getting there. I like you did at the, when you went to the PGA. Yes. So <laughs> now I'm moving towards six Fs, but I, I really, I really leaned on that, you know, that faith F there, quite frankly. And and uh, took the took the leap, and and here I am. And you know, I'm not where I want to be with everything that I'm building, but it's it's happening, which is very encouraging. Yeah, okay. and a good example for your uh, children too. I'm sure uh, that you can make a change uh, at any stage of your life. Um, okay, I think we're ready to transition to some questions from um, our uh, other guests, and we'll start with one that came in from Monica who said, um, says, how important was getting in touch with the vulnerability that raises its head when you have to make significant personal choices and you're no longer leading thousands of people? How did you deal with that? Uh, it, Good question. It, but yeah, that's a great question. It, um, it can be humbling, I guess is the best way to put it when you go from a job where you, know, you walk into an auditorium and everyone's waiting to hear what you, you have to say and then overnight you walk into a meeting of, uh, you know, young entrepreneurs and no one really cares. <laughs> <laughs> so it can be very humbling. And it's, it's a, it was a huge mind, mindset shift for me um, to go from that, managing that large corporation mentality, 6,000 employees and under my team to, you know, I have, I have six employees now. Um, so it's a huge change and I'll say it's, it's humbling. And if you don't humble yourself and understand the respect that all of the others deserve when they're at this level, building companies around you, you probably won't be successful, but employees and customers are pretty much the same. And if you learn that and you understand that you can really have success in, in, in anything I've Thank you. Um, I think you already answered this question. One of the initial questions that we got was, why did you decide to retire when you did? Sounds like you could have continued to work. I think you've explained personal reasons and it was, you know, you wish you'd done it earlier. So anything more on that way? That, I think that answers the question, but I want to honor the fact that it was asked. Yeah, no, I, I don't know if I have more to add on that. I, I wasn't really thinking of retirement actually at the time. It was just I had, I had to make a lifestyle change to make sure I could take care of everything I needed to take care of. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. really what happened. That makes sense. <clears throat> um, question around um, our perspective, uh, yours and mine, Wade, on ageism. Uh, do we value experienced professionals enough to keep them in the workforce as long as they want to be? Yeah, that's kind of a baited question there, right? Yeah, it's a tough uh, one. I, um, that one's tough. Um, 
I think, and this is just Wade's opinion, right? It's not a reflection on any company. I think over time, we have grown to value more, um, more things that outside of just that level of experience. However, uh, if the right candidate with the right level of experience can demonstrate their willingness to adapt and change throughout their career, I don't think there should be any limitation. Yeah, I think that's that. that I concur with that. And I think just uh, given what's happening in the marketplace today, um, you know, I think there's an appreciation for talent and leadership also at any age. Um, so and, yeah, and new ideas are good. New ideas yeah. are good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, question from Mary Erin. Um, is there a book that you've read that you would recommend to others that relates to transition or maybe a book in general? Yes, there's actually a book. It's, um, it's not really related to transition or anything like that in your professional life, but it was written by a board member at Baker Hughes and he gave it to me and his name is Greg Brenneman. And you put me on the spot and I can't remember the title of the book. Um, but it goes through processes very simply on how to build businesses. And it's, it's so easy and he explains it so clearly. Um, gosh, I'm going to have to get the name of that book and, 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 send, and send it to maybe you. Maybe we can, yeah, maybe we can uh, include it in the, um, in a follow-up. Yes. Oh. yes, but I've, I've read it, I've read it like three or four times because it's so simple. And I put to that, you know, I put into work what he preaches in that book and the businesses I've started. I did it in the large uh, organizations I was running in Baker Hughes. And it was great. I would sit with him and have lunch and tell him, you know, all, all about how I put his, his uh, plans into place and where they were working. But it's really helped me a lot. That's good. That's great. And Mary, I don't know if you're asking me as well, but I'll, I'll share one with the group. It's called Halftime. Um, it's by Bob Buford. And it's all focused on his, his belief is that the first half of our careers, oftentimes the first part of our career is focused on success. And the second part can be focused on significance. Um, and um, it's a really interesting read. Um, here's a simple one. Um, Donna is asking you to repeat your five Fs. And maybe you can add your six, courtesy of Christy. Yes, Christy is now six Fs, if you're okay. listening. It's faith, family, friends, fitness, and finance, and now fine. So, you know, some of them are pretty self-explanatory, but... I get, I get asked often about the finance and the fitness portion. So finance can or cannot be lining your pockets. For me, it's not lining your pockets. For me, it's how can I grow a business or how can I build a business to where financially we can do good things, right? Financially, I'm hiring more people. They're providing for their family. Um, we're giving more to charity. Um, anything like that is finance finance driven and the fitness for me is both physically, mentally, emotionally, it, it's the fitness of everything, not just, you know, how much can you bench press? Um, so it's, it's, it's all rolled into one there. I think, I think the faith family friends that is kind of self-explanatory, the fun certainly is, right? <laughs> um, well, maybe kind of piggybacking off of that, there's another question around with the family of nine and kids at really active phases of their lives, how do you share your balance um, in your time between family and work? Is there any advice there? So nine includes our dog. I, that's yeah. right. I got, I, you have to include the dog. Um, gosh, I'm, I'm kind of my own boss. I can really do whatever I want to do now. It, it was, it was extremely hard in corporate America when you have commitments and you're traveling and you know, you're missing birthdays and, anniversaries and all this stuff. But now, I, for instance, I have two daughters that are in college, not too far from here. Um, if I want to go see them, I go see them. Or if they need me, I, I go. Um, so that has really helped me manage that time commitment. I, I have people, I'm blessed enough to have people working with me right now, which can take some of the, that load off from time to time um, and drive the ship. So I take full advantage of that every chance I get. I mean, I'm working from home now. I'm, I'm, I may go out to the back in a minute and have a meeting by the pool. 
So, you know, all of that stuff is uh, encouraging for me, I guess. Yeah, pretty good deal. A little bit better than uh, being in airports all the time. <laughs> Um, here's another one. Uh, it's clear that you've been a, a mentor to many throughout your career. You're continuing to do that, Wade. Um, and you've talked about your transition from senior executive to a non-corporate portfolio career. Um, what suggestions do you have for people who aren't executives but are contemplating career transitions? Anything different or? No, I, I don't I don't think there's any difference really. It's all depends on where you are, where you are at the stage in your career whether it's executive, whether it's director, whether it's manager, whether it's supervisor, whatever it is, when you make that change, there's gonna be some things you have to learn. Um, and the only thing I could say is make sure you have the support team around you to where any of those gaps can be, can be filled rather quickly or be willing to just you know, work the extra hours to, to do every single task that you need to do. <clears throat> every business will be different. Every opportunity will be different. Okay, great. Um, a question that came in as well um, is, is the team at LHH providing this service available publicly? And I'm, I'm thinking that maybe the question must be around uh, transition services. And the answer to that is yes. Um, I would just say if anybody's interested, you can go on lhh.com. Uh, there is a there is a tab for executive transition services, ICEO as well, but we will include uh, contact information um, about this in, in our follow-ups as well. Um, so we'll make sure that if you have any specific questions, we certainly can get in touch with you. Um, looking at, oh, you've gotten some help from the, uh, the audience. The name of the book, uh, Dorothea Bell says, is right away and all at once. That's it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> See, this is a community. That's awesome. Thank you, Dorothea. <laughs> and uh, Francesca typed up your faith, family, fitness, finance, Oh, she put fulfillment plus fun. Faith, family, fitness, finance. What's the? Equals Faith? fulfillment. Pardon me? Equals fulfillment. Faith, family, oh. friends, fitness, finance. Friends. Friends. Friends and finance. Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, we got a lot of help here. <laughs> and Christy is typing in yes, fun. So, so she's. Mm -hmm. She's with you. Um, okay, let's see. Another question was, um, you've talked about the um, strategies about planning for this phase uh, of your career. Any tactical tips, you know, that uh, in terms of navigating the transition, you know, time management, insurance, financial planning, any of that for the- uh, you, I guess every, every situation will, be different somewhat. Um, for me, it was, you know, I, I needed to take some time off to breathe. So I kind of took a step back for a month and did whatever I needed to do. <clears throat> um, I didn't realize how expensive health insurance was, um, you know, until, until my uh, mine expired and I started looking around. So that's interesting. Um, but, you know, I think really it, it depends on the individual and where you are and your situation. I don't have any cookie cutter approach to any of it. Um, hopefully, whoever you are, you have that support team around you. I think for me, that was the biggest, that was the biggest contributor of how I moved from, oh my gosh, now what am I going to do? I'll never be successful in anything again until, you know, where I am today. It's, it's, it's very important to have that support staff, whether it's your family, your spouse, your kids, your co-workers, mentors that have left the company before you that can you kind of show you the way. There's all different types of support systems that people have, but I do think that is the one thing that, that is very important. Okay, um, okay I'm reading uh, another question that came in. You've talked a lot about humility, Wade. Um, you know, I was always the person that people came to and asked for advice and help with my career. How did you make, how did you make the shift from being the person that people asked for help to going and asking for help? Yeah, that, Uncomfortable. that was, a uh, <laughs> that was also part of being humble, right? When you first start that, at least for me and many of the clients I've had, when you first dive into networking, it can, it can be uncomfortable, right? You, you've had that big position and 
like the question says, people coming to you and asking you for advice and help and guidance to picking up a phone and saying, hey, you know, here's my situation. I'd love, love to meet as many people as I can. It's, again, one of those things that is humbling, but at least I, I found and have and continue to find people generally are happy to help, especially if you have any sort of relationship with them in the past. They're generally happy to help you. Now, they might not say, hey, I've got this job for you, but they may be able to put you in touch with other people that you can meet and talk with and you know, be that reference if needed. Um, but it took me, it sort of took a push to get me headed in that direction without a doubt. Well, and, you know, I don't know if you experienced this yourself, Wade, but one thing I have found personally when I did it and, and some of my uh, uh, people that I work with as well is um, somebody can be having a really tough week, uh, somebody that you reach out to and ask for some help. And when you ask them about their journey, how did you make the transition from this industry to that industry or out of corporate America to board roles or whatever? Um, as they start sharing their story with you, a couple of people have come back and said, you know, I have done a lot of good things. I mean, it just reminds them <laughs> of their success. You know, so sometimes I think going into it with a headset that they're getting something out of the conversations as well is, is, is always the case, I think. For sure. Um, and maybe just, uh, so you, one of the things that you said you did is you reached out to your mentors, you know, uh, had conversations with them. Any other suggestions on networking and putting yourself out there in terms of identifying who your contacts are and then reaching out to them? You know, I think, um, I think Kathy has a great plan um, on how to begin the, the networking piece of it. Um, and so you don't get overwhelmed, right? It can, it can turn into an overwhelming, you can, be on the, you can be on the phone eight hours a day. She helps break that down into, you know, three different groups and how you get going and how you use each one of those groups. Um, so that's something I would recommend everyone to learn about. But really it's just when you get started and you reach out to that first person that is willing to help is when, you know, you can see some encouragement. Everyone understands the position that you're probably in. Um, and for me, you know, I, I, I would reach out. My first call was to a gentleman who, who was a uh, supervisor of mine, my boss, who had left Baker Hughes, started a small company, been successful. He was my first call. And he put me in contact with private equity firms and several smaller companies. Now, I didn't, I didn't choose that direction. Um, and they didn't offer me anything, right? But it was something that kind of got me going and started that process and the wheels spinning to where it was much more easier. And I realized they are, they are there to help. People enjoy helping. And if they can, they will. But it is up to you to make that contact and keep the contact fresh, right? Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the three groups uh, from Kathy, just for the benefit of the, the group that's listening and they may not be familiar with that. So. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, there's so there's a group that if you can meet anyone, any five people to help you, who would they be? I'm sort of an aspirational group. A group of, I really want to start diving into this group um, and list them out. And don't, don't put 100 people down. Maybe start with five or 10 if you're comfortable. And then a group of, this is my practice group, right? It might be the people you really, really, really know well. Um, might be a, you know, a colleague and you start with that group. And often people, that practice group leads to employment, <clears throat> but it's a different way of looking and, and how you reach out and contact and aspire to move up the chain in some of those groups as you go through the networking process. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> practice group, a group of friendlies, people that know you and respect you. Um, you said a lot of great things about your career at Baker Hughes. Did they support you in the transition process? No, they did. They they paid for LHH, so that's how that's how they supported me. But that was that was pretty good. That's good. That's good. 
And I see a, a follow up from uh, Andrea who said <laughs> the book seems to be more focused about growing a business. Are there any books specifically about successfully transitioning into retirement that you're aware of, Wade? No, I, again, I, don't, I didn't really consider I was moving into retirement, so I've not, I've not researched that. I, re, I apologize. Yeah, I, I, I can say that the halftime book, it isn't so much, it's the same. It's, it's sort of had you uh, have, have focused on success, maybe in a corporate career or in your career up to a certain point in your life. And then you say, I want to continue giving back in some capacity. Um, and I'm going to be focusing more on significance. So that might be a little closer to what you're looking for, uh, Andrea, um, not so much on the transition process. So the author of Halftime is Bob Buford. I don't know if you can, eh, I'm not doing a good job of showing it on my camera here, but B-U-F-O-R-D, Bob Buford. Um, okay, I think, uh, let me see if there's any other questions coming in. Uh, if not, um, I guess Wade, uh, just over to you in terms of any final wrap up comments, any last words of advice that you would share with us? Yeah, I, I guess really just being nervous and being uncertain is okay. Um, it, it, you're not alone, even I, I would imagine that anyone who takes this step or goes through this process has some uncertainty and some questions and a bit of, uh, of nervousness about what will happen next. But depending on who your support staff is, if it's LHH or whoever it might be, I think that's critical to, to helping anybody get, get through uh, this phase and end up where you wanna be. Um, a way of looking at it as well is for, for the first time in many, many years, you have the opportunity to choose. Great, great way to end. And I, I do have to give, I, I didn't scroll down. So there's a couple more um, questions that came in. Um, one is, um, will there be more sessions that focus on transition to retirement? Absolutely. We have another one in July. Oh my goodness, I can't remember the date. It will we'll include that in the um, uh, follow-up note so that everybody knows it. Um, <laughs> And um, so we are gonna continue them. Um, and so more to come on that. And then we will be sharing a recording as well. So if you um, wanted to, to rewatch this or, or you know, zoom in on a certain part of one, one of Wade's wonderful tips, or if you know somebody um, that you think could benefit from this, um, from Wade's story, then certainly you could pass that along as well. Um, and it looks like, okay, okay. Okay, I do have one final question that came in. Um, the question from a, one of our participants is, what might you think that your portfolio would look like 10 years from now? How do you think it's going to change with time? Oh, wow. I, um, I think it will grow. I, I, I do. Um, I think there will be additional businesses added. Some, some or all of them might still be here. Um, I do think I will continue to reach out and try and give back more. So your trend, your book, Katie, is, is exceptional. Um, so as I, as I, 10 years from now, uh, you know, I'll call it a mini conglomerate um, that will, will have different levels, but one thing that will still be dear to me will be able to spend time with my family, do the things that I want. And then also how I grow and become, uh, you know, a bigger part of the community and that development here. Excellent, excellent. All right, um, thank you so much, Wade, uh, for your your insights and for sharing your story so openly. Um, really appreciate it, and I can tell from some of the comments um, that others. Um, you know, appreciate it as well. Um, so I wish you all the best. Thank you everyone that was able to join us and we will be following up uh, with an email with the recording um, information on our next uh, session in July and certainly contact information if you have any questions for us. So thank you again. Hope everyone has a great rest of the day. <laughs>